Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom to all of you. And we're so glad that we have people in the audience today, first timers in the house, and those that are watching online. We say Rahim Habaim to all of our first timers in the house. And uh, we're so grateful that you have joined us. Some of you have even joined us in the dance today. Come on, give it up for yourself for dancing. I mean, no, that's a, an art in and of itself. So if you, you put your feet to the movement to praise the Lord and dance like David danced, how many know God is going to bless your ankles in the name of Yeshua, amen? So that you will not get too sore and dance with us again, amen? So we are excited to jump in again to our series called Promised Land Preparation. We had week one with Bemid Bar, the book of Numbers, as the beginning of the new book. And it was all about training followers as disciples who are prepared to walk after the Torah and its promises. How many know the promised land was a promise from God? Amen. And all the promises of God in Messiah are what? Yes, yes and, amen. and amen. We can say ken ken, which is yes in Hebrew. Yes, yes, ken ken, cc. Our first message was preparing our hearts for the Torah. Week two from Parshat Naso was blessings are the result of God's promises. Week three last week was follow the cloud and be led by the spirit. From Bechalotcha. And this week from Parshat Shalach Lacha, which means send out for yourself. It's referring to the spies. Week four is about a spiritual survey for possessing the promised land. Say with me. Spiritual survey for possessing the promised land. The readings come from Bimidbar Numbers 13, 1 through 15, 41. We also heard Yehoshua or Joshua 2, 1 through 24. And then from Messianic Jews, which you know is Hebrews chapter 3, 7 through 19, we had this idea of going into the promised land and experiencing by faith, mixing our faith with the word of God uh, so that we can inherit all the promises of God because we should actually be very concerned about not, about not entering the promises of God. We did a whole series, eight weeks, on the book of Hebrews. And how many enjoyed that series that we did? One of our online afternoon studies as this afternoon we are gonna be looking at the fourth, uh, excuse me, the fifth lesson of becoming a disciple of Yeshua and with the intro, that would make week six, which is specifically becoming a worshiper. So today, this afternoon, we'll talk about becoming a worshiper as we follow in the footsteps of the Messiah and literally walk in the dust of the rabbi. How many have learned a lot about walking in the dust of the rabbi? From this ancient uh, reference from the Mishnah, and uh, I love the fact that we can continue even 2,000 years later to still walk after the footsteps of Rabbi Yeshua. And I think it's going to be a great study as we look at uh, this week what it means to be a worshiper. We'll look at some Hebrew terms for worship. We'll understand it from the Hebrew scriptures and also from New Testament Greek, what the Greek equivalent to the translation of the Hebrew text is. And this week, as we jump into the spiritual survey for possessing the promised land, we're going to start with our theme verse out of Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 3. I pray today that you would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand the word that's being spoken to you today. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Devarim or Deuteronomy 27, 3 says, Then you will be, excuse me, then you are to write on them all the words of this Torah, when you cross over, cross over where? Cross over to where? The promised land. So that you may enter the land that Adonai your God is giving you, a land flowing with what? Milk and honey, or in Hebrew, Eretz Zavach And it says, just as Adonai the Lord, God of your fathers, promised you. What did he promise you? The land. So you can't talk about the promises of God without the promises of the land. Because the promises of God were given to Israel when they were entering the promised land after they had come out of the wilderness and had exited Egypt. So that all the promises of God that we have right now in Messiah, they all started with the promises that God gave Abraham and God gave Moses and God continues to speak to our hearts to enter into the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land in which all the promises of God are ken ken, yes, yes, in Messiah. Amen? 
This week's reading comes from Numbers 13.1. Let's read in the Tree of Life version. It says, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, send some men on your behalf. In Hebrew, it is shalach lacha, send for yourself. It says, to investigate the land, literally survey or reconnoiter the land, reconnoiter the land, the land of Canaan, which it, I am giving to B'nai Israel. Notice they're called Israel, or B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel, which is the nickname for who? Jacob, Jacob who is the son of who? Isaac, who is the son of who? Abraham. So Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzhak, Elohei Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has given the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the land. And so therefore, when you're looking at this, you see that it is to B'nai Israel, but the land of Canaan will be called Yisrael, which is the territory, the prize, the inheritance given to the people called Yisrael. And this is what we translate into Israel by dropping the Y. But this name, Israel is a name spiritually given to one who was willing to wrestle with an angel, therefore wrestle with God. And out of that wrestling match, a hip was thrown out, a sci sciatic nerve began, a sciatica problem began, and then all of a sudden the limp in Jacob reminded him that you can't wrestle with God. You know, but he did wrestle with God and man, and somehow he prevailed. He didn't prevail physically, but he definitely prevailed spiritually. And that spiritual blessing includes blessings of inheritance that are financial and economic and are uh, agricultural and blessings that are uh, referred to landscape and to land promises that God gave Israel when they were in the wilderness. So we gotta see what the blessings are here because the blessing is given to Israel who's called Israel before the land was called Israel. It was called previously Canaan land, but it was really the land of the Canaanites because it's saying the land where they were dwelling. They didn't own it. Who owns the land? Who owns the earth? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell in it. So God can actually portion out not only different nations with different land territory, but he can give certain promises to certain peoples. Amen? It goes on to say, verse Two, the latter part says, each man is to send a prince for the tribe of his fathers. Literally, Ishachad, Ishachad, one man, one man, meaning each man shall give a prince that will represent the tribe, a man for each tribe, or a prince for each tribe. So according to the word of Adonai, Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All the men were princes of B'nai Israel. Verse 16, without the long list of names, says, these are the names of the men Moses sent to investigate the land. If you want to know those names, read verses 4 through 15. And these are the names of the men that God sent to investigate the land. Now he gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name what? Joshua. Well, that's the English. What does the Hebrew say? He gave Hosea the name Yehoshua. Yehoshua. Shortened with an Aramaic form becomes what? Yeshua. So Yeshua is the Aramaic form of the original Hebrew, Yehoshua. And you can see almost all the letters <clears throat> of the name of God in his spelling by taking the He and the Vav that makes the H and the O of Hosea and adding in to the front of it the letter Yud. So that would mean Yud, He, Vav, without the final He, is the first part of his name which is sometimes translated like in Elijah's name, Eliyahu. Again, vowels really don't matter in Hebrew. They change all the time. It's the construct of the vowel, of the, the, the consonants that make the difference. <clears throat> so when you think about the name here, the name of God changed from he will be a savior or he will save to Ya'adonai will save. So when we think about the praise, hallelujah, that's one form of the name by taking only two letters. Eliyahu takes three letters as the three letters of God's name, yud he vav in front of Hosea. And it contracts to say that Yah, or Adonai, saves. So when you think about the victory that Joshua's going to have, what was God saying to Joshua? Don't think that it was by your might or your power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord, that this is going to be delivered to you. This land is going to be yours. Uh, verse 17 says, as he sent them to explore the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up 
through the Negev. Then go up into the hill country. Notice the strategy. He says, see what the land is like and the people living there, whether they might be strong or weak, few or many, in what kind of land are they living? Is it good or bad? Also, what about the cities in which they're living? Are they unwalled or do they have fortifications? How is the soil? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do, do your best to bring back some of the what? The fruit of the land and it was the season for the first ripe grapes. So you can see we're talking about the fall feasts of the Lord in, in what's going to be a fulfillment of the harvest in the land. It's talking about the time where grapes would come, kind of summer into the fall or autumn. So the first thing you see from this text is you have to always ask the right questions. You see, the problem with theology today is we're not asking the right questions. And the rabbi that found a child that asked the most questions and the right questions became the potential new rabbi in town. He was the young man who's going to go all through his Hebrew training and Torah academies and study in the yeshiva of Israel, especially Jerusalem. And he's going to study with the Pharisees. He's going to understand what the Sadducees believe. And he's going to ask all the right questions. And he's going to be able to be a scholar, Rabbi Eric, because someone like yourself that's a young man but you're digging into the wisdom of the sages. When you have a study, when you have a study of Torah, when you learn about Shabbat, and you embrace Shabbat, when you study what did Rashi say, or what did, what did uh, Rambam say, or what did all these other scholars say, and, and not only ancient scholars, but even modern scholarship. What are we still studying about the Torah and understanding? I think when it came to our Breed Hadashah reading, we were talking about how important it is to discern what the voice of God is. Sadly enough, we have churches that are trying to, that are trying to discern the voice of God without the word of God. Because we either have churches that lean a lot on the word of God and no spirit, or a lot on the spirit of God and no word. And so then they say, well, well we're going to be a grace church where, where it's, uh, it's no legalism, right? But then they have spiritual anarchy. Where everybody does what they want. I actually know a congregation where they actually, in a charismatic church, they put microphones up the front, and anybody at any time can go up to the microphone and prophesy as long as they want. So you never know if a, a clear message is going to go forth. You never know if a clear song of praise is going to go forth. Because at any time, someone can feel the Spirit go up to a microphone. And I'm not against the Holy Spirit. I am a Spirit-filled rabbi. I believe in the Rock of Kodesh. I believe in His inspiration. I believe that none of us could live without him dwelling in us, he's the greater one in us. Greater is he that's in the world, and he that uh, greatest is uh, greater is the one that's in us than he that's in the world. The spirit of God dwells in us, but we have to be careful of always leaning on the spirit and not saying what the Torah says, because that's the first principles of the oracle of God. And then read what the prophets had to say, and then read what the royal writings had to say, and then very cautiously step in the feet of Messiah and come to the Bema and study the Torah and read the Torah and be a regular attender of the synagogue, a regular reader of the synagogue and read from the Torah and then you get the chance to read from the prophets just like Messiah and he could read Isaiah 61 and say the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Then the spirit can come upon us when we're walking in the wisdom of the Torah. And if we're not walking in the wisdom of the Torah, we have no blueprint to build with. I can't get an amen for nothing today. We don't have a blueprint to build with if we're not building on the foundation that creation itself was built upon. And that is the divine words of the Torah, given to man to curate and to share with the whole world. God said, I will speak this word of Hebrew into 70 languages, split off into cloven tongues of fire at Sinai before it was Acts chapter 2. That's the Shavuot message of Pentecost. We forget that, that God wanted all nations to hear it, but only Israel said, not say, Benishma, all that you've said we will do. So the problem is, are we asking the right questions? And sometimes we go into a verse. Have you ever done this? You read a verse and you think, well, I've heard that verse before. I know that verse. So you don't even question the text anymore. I'll never forget when someone read me John 3.16 and I got stuck on the word so. <laughs> Two letters. For God, not just love the world, he so loved the, the world. He didn't just love you and your imperfections. He loved your future, too. 
He loved your future generations. He saw, if you will, loosely say this, down the corridors of time. He's really in eternity. <laughs> he inhabits it. But he saw your future. He saw past your mistakes. He saw past your situation. Instead of telling God your problems, start asking God questions. God, what do you want me to do? God, give me wisdom. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to speak? Where should I go? Who should I talk to? What job should I have? What should I study? What school should I go to? Who should I sit under? What rabbi is going to teach me the Torah? Who am I going to learn from? Can I ask them questions and are they going to listen? Or are they just going to tell me what they know all day? Or are they going to listen to my questions and say, wow, that's a really good question. Hey, let's study it together. And you look at the kind of drosh that the teacher uh, or the, the, the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah begins to share when they study the Torah and they share it with the congregation. Or the rabbi or the chazan when they're sharing little tidbits, little noshes of Torah with you. Or maybe it's just a member of the congregation and you walk out the door and someone says, hey, guess what I was reading this week. You know what? Everybody has something that the Spirit of God has given them. And if we're not asking questions, we're never going to learn. Oh, that was a good time for a good hearty. Amen. We need to ask the right questions. We assume we have answers, and we don't. This is why some people come to me and say, Rabbi, why is it my Jewish friends don't come to faith in Messiah? Hmm. I ask them a question. Do you even know what their concerns are? Do you know what their questions are? Have you properly studied before you speak to answer them? Slow to speak. Have you figured out why the Jewish community as a whole doesn't see the current teaching of Jesus Christ as Yeshua, who is the Mashiach. Because if we can get past those hurdles and ask the right questions, then we are potentially able to not only learn first, but to share what we've learned. Amen? Amen. How many know a disciple of Yeshua is not just a follower, he's also a learner? Yes. And if we're not learners, we won't learn what we need to learn. Look what the text says in Deuteronomy 1.21, that is a counterpart to our story or a confirmation of our story. Last words of Moses in the last 30 days of his life before he dies, before he's able to view the promised land yet not enter it. Deuteronomy 121, Moses says, see Adonai your God has set the what? The land before you. Go up, take what? Possession. As Adonai God of your fathers has promised you. What did he promise? He promised you possession of the land. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged. Come on, tell your neighbor, don't be discouraged. Then all of you came near to me. Look at the 12 spies. Came near to him and said, or actually they're just the leaders of the land. There's nothing in the 12 spies yet. It says, you all came near to me, meaning all the men of Israel. It says, let sin men ahead of us to explore the land for us and bring us back word about the way we should go and the cities we will enter. Seems so deceiving, right? Yeah, let's just send some men ahead before we go directly in. We just want to get a little feedback. What city should we go in first? What cities, you know, will be the ones we conquer? You know, let's just kind of like, you know, have a little, little celebration share with everybody. Here's the vision board, you know. Here's the dream, what we're going to go in. Let's just have some, you know, it's just confirmation for the people. Really, they were questioning God, amen? And God didn't come up with this idea. They did. God just said, okay, you want to do that? Go for it. When Israel wanted a king, he says, okay, you asked for a king, I'll give you Saul. His name means asked for. You asked for him, you got him. Look what it says. Uh, after the, they went to Moses, verse 23 says, the idea seemed good to who? To me, Moses said. Okay, seems good to me. He knows what they're thinking, just like Yeshua knew the thoughts of the Pharisees. Okay, you want to go that route? Go for it. So he says, the idea seemed good to me. So I took 12 men from among you, one man from each tribe. And these were the questions they asked. Look, here's the survey. What kind of land is it? Now, have you ever been to Israel? Let me see the hands that have been to Israel. How's the land? What part did you go in? I went to a land flowing with milk and honey. I look at a land that seemingly was no man's land that's turned to the most beautiful cities and fruitfulness that supplies more juice than you can imagine to all of Europe with its Jaffa juice. 
I see a land where there was no mound, and then there's Tel Aviv, the mound that man built, but I also see the city that God built, Jerusalem. And I see a land that, even though it's been destroyed, I think they said 19 different times they've tried to conquer Jerusalem. But it's in the hands of the Jewish people today. See, I don't see ruin. I see resurrection. Because when you go to the land, it's more than what you see. It's what you experience. So when you go to the land, you see it's like the spies. They all saw the same land. Only two saw the good in the land. The rest saw the giants and the problems. What have you been looking at lately? Are you focused on the problem? Are you focused on the promise? Okay, I'm going to give you another chance. Let me see that those that have gone to the land of Israel. How many actually were you're in Israel on a tour? Unless you went on your own. Anybody just go on their own? Okay, you went on a tour. Did you see all the pretty places they took you to? Did you see, go to places where people were inhabited? What was your experience there? Beautiful. You said busy. That means a lot of people. How many would say it was beautiful? Productive. Very productive. It was no man's land. Now it's everybody wants to own it. Everybody wants to go there. Do you understand we're just like the spies? You don't see any good in the land. You'll never go. How are you going to live there for eternity? And you don't see any appreciation in it now. Why should God give us the land? You see, the reason why there was question about the land is because people didn't appreciate what they had. You know, you never appreciate something until it's gone. When you're in exile, you should cry out to God to deliver you and bring you back to the land. How many like to go back to the land? If you've been there before or haven't been there, how many like to go back to the land? How many would like to go to the land? Never been? Okay, now that's looking better. But you've got to be like the two versus the ten. You've got to see beauty in it. You've got to see God's plan in it. You've got to see God's purpose in the nation of Israel. You can't look at it as this small nation that's insignificant. That's what the Arabs think. That they can wipe it off the face of the earth. It's so insignificant. That there was no palace of David. That there was no kingdom called Israel. That there was no nationhood. That there was no place that the Israelis owned. That there was no place for worship on the Temple Mount. Then why do you keep throwing away artifacts and not letting the archaeologist discover the things they need to discover to prove some things that they've had to literally just fight for their right to hold on to these little things that prove, yes, we were in the land. It's shameful to me that our Bible doesn't matter enough to say, this is God's land. Every one of us should have thrown our hands up and just like, yes, it's a beautiful land. I don't care what your experience was. That was the tour guide's fault. That was the tour company's fault. But God's land is blessed, amen? amen. It's flowing with milk and honey. Until we get to that place, you'll never go to the land. Let me tell you what my Hebrew teacher told me. Brian, when are we going to the land? This is before she really called me rabbi. This is all in the beginning stages. So when are we going to Israel? I said, oh, one day, one day. She goes, no, no, when are we going to Israel? Oh, uh, 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 sorry, Benor. Yes, one day I'm going to go to Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, when are we going to Israel? She goes, yeah, well, well I want to go, but I don't have the money to go. I didn't ask you if you had the money to go. She says, when are we going? She says, until you say you want to go, the provision won't come. The moment you begin to speak by faith, I'm going to a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to go to the blessings of the land of my people. And I'm going to go walk in the footsteps of Yeshua. Until you say you want to do it, it's not going to happen. I'm not talking about naming and claiming. I'm talking about declaring the promise that God said in his word. Not man, not what you want, but what God has already said. Amen? I love this. They said, what kind of land is it? So what kind of land is it? Land flowing with milk and honey. What kind of people are there? What kind of people live there? Now let's talk about Jerusalem. Let's talk about the Israelis. What kind of people live there? All kinds. A kind, loving, hospitable people that will take you into their home and feed you their last meal. I had a Holocaust survivor feed me her last can of tuna. She made me tuna fish sandwiches. It was the most delicious tuna fish sandwich I've ever made as I literally wept at her stories. 2007. I want to go see if she's still alive. I want to sit in her small apartment. I want to sit at her table. Chair was barely holding me up. Probably my fault. <laughs> but that tuna fish sandwich tasted like manna from heaven for me because she began to say, it was the believers in Yeshua that saved me as a little girl. She had, <laughs> in her eyes, 
And she heard and she experienced the pain of the Holocaust as a child. Parents gone. But she says, I'm living in the land because this land was given to me. This is my people's land. It's our inheritance from our God. I love the fact that she didn't care about a big, fancy, rich apartment or a, a house or a palace to live in. She didn't need it to be fancy. She just needed it to be hers. Amen. Amen. When you had to take ownership. Look at the strength and the weakness. Do, how many know that everybody has strengths and weaknesses? The question is, do you know each other's strengths and weaknesses? Do, what's the strength of an Israeli? That even a young girl with a gun on her back will say, I'm ready to fight for what God gave me. I'm ready to stand and believe. And guess what? They walk in total peace and security. How? I asked a young girl, how is it that you just don't seem afraid when you're walking around? She goes, it's not the gun on my back. It's the peace in my heart. She goes, because it's not promised to any of us. And the scripture came to mind when she said that. She goes, you know, tomorrow's not promised, she told me. An Israeli girl, she goes, tomorrow's not promised. So that's why us Israelis, we live every day to the fullest. Because we never know which day will be our last. I should put some fire on some of our kettles. Get our percolators boiling. What is the number or quantity of the people? How many people are there? Are they small in number or are they large in number? You know, they always started small, 600,000 600, men. It's always like the number we got reduced back to. And then all of a sudden they'd multiply into millions. I mean, man, it just talking about be fruitful and multiply. Not only the land, it's the people. What is the quality of the land like? It's the quality. Do you understand that quantity is not so important as quality? We have a lot of land in America. Yes. Give me a little spot in Israel for part of the year and a little spot in Italy, and I'm good. I'm good. I just, I just want to do Because I'm thinking to myself, it doesn't matter how big. How valuable is it to you? Amen? And then the next question. Do they have fortified or open camps? Because that would teach them whether they had to fight or not. Is it like Jericho or, you know, is it fortified or is it something that we can just go in and possess the land? The seventh question was, what is the fertility of the soil like? Is it fertile soil? Because if we sow like God promised us, he would give us seed to sow. If we sow in the land like Isaac, will we reap a hundredfold harvest still as he did? I mean, no, Yeshua used a parable and only good soil could produce a hundredfold harvest in Luke 8, 8. And he was actually reflecting on Isaac who sowed in the land of Israel. And in that land, the land he was born in, the land he lived in, the land he died in, Asabra, the land, Isaac experienced a hundredfold harvest because the land was fruitful and it could multiply because the soil was rich with nutrients. I'm about to plant something in my backyard. Come on, let's do it. Take the compost. Take all the trash and make some... It start growing something, you know. Can you imagine what it's like to be in the Garden of Eden, you know, and just have everything just naturally grown, just all by itself because God gar was the gardener? <laughs> but then you got to go in the land of Israel. You think, oh, i got to start from scratch. No, you don't. The land's already flowing with milk and honey. It's already flowing with date honey from the date trees. And then number eight, the question is, does the land have forest or wood? Now, what do you need wood for? <laughs> you need a bill. Like Solomon's Temple was built with? Cedars of Lebanon, right? And so you see, you have to know if there's forest, because if there's forest, you've got to cut it down to make room for cities. And then is there wood for building? So when you talk about all these questions, it reminds me of when Yeshua is seen in Luke 2.46 as a young child, a young, a young person getting ready to prepare for what we call the bar mitzvah age. It says, after three days, they found him, found Yeshua, in the temple, sitting in the center of the, the who? The teachers. What was he doing? Listening. He was listening to them and asking them questions. Notice he wasn't asking their questions until he first listened. Sometimes we try to say a rebuttal or ask a question before the person's even finished. So we miss the real question we could be asking because we didn't hear the whole statement being made. Or the question that was being asked of us. We immediately just, you know, jumped the gun. Maybe you got mad in an argument and you said, well, when was the last time you took out the trash? Or when was the last time you did this? You know, we're already jumping on the other person's case because we're asking the wrong question, right? Yeshua asked questions because he first listened. Verse 47 says, and those hearing him were astonished at his what? Understanding and his answers. Wait a minute. 
the understanding and the answers. Why did it say understanding and answers? Why didn't it just say answers? What was the understanding? It was the kind of questions he asked. Do you know a rabbi can understand the level of understanding of their student by the kind of questions they ask? Are they surface questions or are they deep? You know, our afternoon study, we have this section where we go deeper. We ask questions. The purpose is to see what you know. And sometimes you might have a question based upon my question. What did you mean by that question? Well, you gotta ask the right question to the right person at the right time to get the right what? The right answer. And I love this, and right before his parents get a little upset, <laughs> it says they were here, I mean, can you imagine you, your name's on the good board? You know, my daughter used to say, Dad, my, my name wasn't on the bad board or the good board. I said, no, honey, you want your name on the good board. But she was just glad her name was not on the bad board. His, Yeshua's name was on the good board. All these Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law, the scribes, they were talking about Yeshua. Have you seen this kid? He's in my class. And you know, it kind of reminds me of what Gamaliel probably said. Gamaliel probably said, hey, have you met this kid, Shaul? Saul, he's like really good. He grew up you know, from a young tyke. His parents dropped him off to study in Yeshiva with me. And he's been at my feet ever since. And you know, this is the kind of stuff that we forget. You know, it's not the answers that you think you have that make you smart. It's the questions you're willing to ask because you're willing to listen. If you can be more like Yeshua, we need to listen more and ask more questions if we're going to have better understanding and better answers. Amen? Amen. Almost done. I'm not going to keep you long today. Watch this. And second point today is always surround yourself with the right people. So not only should you always ask the right questions, you need to what? Always surround yourself with the right people. Look at Numbers 1330. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should certainly go up and capture the land, for we can certainly do it. Look at how positive Caleb was in his faith. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot attack these people because they are what? Stronger than we are. Now, you were just asked what's their strength and what their weakness is. Why was he asked that question? The, the spies? Why were they asked? Because your giants might be strong in one area, but there's always a weak spot. David found it, right? David found the center of his skull, the center of his, he aimed right for the things that the enemy thought about David. Oh, you think that about me? I'm about to slay that very thought. He took his slingshot and threw it, that little five smooth stones, only took only one stone and knocked that devil down right in the place where he was thinking negative about David. That's what you need to do in the enemy. What does the enemy think about you? Uh -uh, let me tell you what I think about you. Bam. <laughs> Knock him down with the word of God. Watch this. It says they're too strong. But you never answered the question then, where are they weak? Where are they weak? Because if you can find the enemy's weakness instead of him, find yours. Oh, come on, somebody. I know it's warm today. But if you can find the enemy's weakness instead of him, find yours then you can defeat him no matter how strong and how powerful you think the enemy is. Because you actually have authority over his power. Amen. You've been given all authority over the power of the enemy. And it says, they said that they're too strong for us. They spread B'nai Israel a bad report about the land they had explored, saying the land through which we have passed to explore devours its inhabitants and all the people we saw there are men of great size. Now, think about this. If you think about the negative report of these spies and think about the negative report of the friends of Job, there's a similarity. Job in Eov 6.14 says, friends should be loyal to you in times of what? Trouble. Trouble. So yeah, the giants are big. And yeah, the giants are strong. And yeah, the giants are talking smack at us. Just like Goliath did David. But how many know your friends shouldn't be talking smack? Your friends should not be talking smack about you. If they're a real friend, they should tell you to your face what they think of you and not to your back or to your friend's ear behind your back. Ouch, right? We could all do, we've all done it. We just have to own it to change it, amen? Look what it says, we should be loyal in the times of trouble even if you turn away from God, all powerful. So even the people that turned away from God, don't give up on them. Be a loyal friend. But I can not depend on you, Job says, my brothers, Achim, 
Verse 25 says, honest words are powerful, but your arguments prove nothing. Do you plan to criticize me? Will you speak more tiring words, meaning against me? Verse 29 says, you need to start all over and stop being so unfair. Think again, because I am innocent. I am not lying. I know right from wrong. It reminds me of the spirit of Caleb and Joshua. I know right from wrong. You're not being loyal, you ten spies that are supposed to be princes of Israel. You're supposed to go in there and say, if God said it, we can do it. And that settles it. Amen? Amen. I can do all things through Messiah that strengthens me. But if you're going to go in there kind of complaining or being an unloyal friend, or an unloyal soldier of the Lord, or an unloyal believer, guess what? You're never going to inherit something you don't believe in. You're never going to inherit something you don't believe in. As I close today, you got to always believe and prepare yourself to possess the right promises. You have to always believe. You can't, you know, love does what? We learned last week about love. Love never fails because love always hopes. Love always believes. How many put their name in the love test? That you put Brian is patient and Brian is kind and Brian is not easily angered or provoked. Anybody work on that one? Patience and provoking and, right? All the things that we fail sometimes. Well, Brian doesn't fail. Tell yourself that every month. You're on the treadmill. You want to quit. Say, Brian doesn't fail. Yeah, that's what I'm telling myself in the name of Yeshua. Because I don't want to work out. But I need to. In the name of the Lord. Pandemic pounds go away. <laughs> But I need to. And i got to tell myself what God says about me. I can do it through Messiah. Come on, you can do it. Tell your neighbor you can do it. Through Messiah. Come on, watch this. you got to always believe. Look at Joshua 1.10. Now they're in the land. Yehoshua. 1.10 says, When Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan. I, I wish I could tell somebody you're going to cross over. Come on, you're going to make it. You're going to possess it. You're going to have that child. You're going to have that car. You're going to have that new job. You're going to get that promotion. You're going to get that open door to the prison house for ministry. You're going to get that, 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 that sink fix and that refrigerator replaced and the synagogue refreshed. And you're going to have an outreach and an inreach. And you're going to have a global international ministry. And you're going to go to Israel. And you're going to have a tour. And you're going to be a victorious leader. And you're going to lead your friends and your family to the Lord. And your crazy cousins will get saved. And you're, you're a sick and she will be healed. you got to sometimes have someone convince you and tell you, you can cross over. you got to cross over. you got to believe in the promises of God. He says, tell them that you're going to cross over this Jordan to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. I love this because when you get to the end of Joshua, Joshua 21, 43, so Adonai gave to Israel, to who? Israel. To Israel, the part of the land. Oh, it says entire? Oh, that's just our politics. It says, Adonai gave to Israel the entire land that he had sworn to give to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they what? They took possession and settled in it. Then Adonai gave them rest on all sides, all borders. Nobody wiping them out. Did you hear this? It's about what they believed. And what they acted upon in their belief. And what word of God they were standing on. And the promise they were, they were proclaiming that mattered. It says they had rest on all sides. Shalom on all sides. Just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one man of all their enemies withstood them. Not one. Not one nation can withstand Israel. Not one nation can withstand you as a believer in Messiah. Nobody's going to come against you. No weapon for him. Verse 44 says, Adonai gave them rest on all sides, just as he swore to their fathers. No man was able uh, or enemy was able to withstand them. For Adonai gave all their enemies into their hand. Watch this. Read this with me. Verse 45. Not one good thing that Adonai had promised to the house of Israel, what? Failed. All came to pass. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm sure David knew it in Psalm 37, 8. He says, don't give in to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. Remember, friends are loyal during trouble. Those who trust in the Lord will what? Possess, possess the land. So it's your trust and faith in God that allows you to possess the promise. Yes. It says in verse 9, the latter part, it says, but the wicked will be driven out. Verse 22 says, those who are blessed by the Lord will possess the land. I close the day with Hebrews 4, 1. 4 1 says, Therefore, let us be terrified of the possibility that even though the promise of entering his rest remains, 
any one of you might be judged to have fallen short of it, for the good news has been proclaimed to us, just as it was to them, to Israel. But the message they heard didn't do them any good because those who heard it did not combine it or mix it, King James says, with trust, or King James says, with faith. But it is we who have trusted who enter the rest. Verse 8 says, For if Yehoshua or Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later of another day. So there remains a Shabbat keeping for God's people. Amen. Amen. The Shabbat is still ours. The land is still a promise. The Jewish people will receive the spirit of grace and supplication. They will see the one who was pierced and they will accept him as Messiah and a redeemer will come back to Zion. And Jerusalem will be rebuilt again on its rubble. And all of the nations will come to celebrate with Israel. And we will celebrate the festival of Sukkot for every year to celebrate in the millennium the fact that God is the victor. And we are not victims any longer. Amen? Amen. I love what Leo Tolstoy says. He says, one needs a vision of the promised land in order to have the strength to move. Do you receive this message today? I'm praying that somebody has the strength to make a move. I'm praying that someone watching online has the strength to make a move. You need a vision of the promised land. You need to just keep the promised land as the vision. Every true believer, that's your land. That's the, that's the land of our forefathers. It is the land of Abraham today, amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet today and give God a hand clap of praise. Thanksgiving for all his promises today. Rabbi Eric, would you join me today? I love how they send them out by twos. Well, these are two rabbis that love, his, that love their people. Amen. Amen. We love our people. We love our synagogue. We'll do anything to fight for it. Amen. But we also are going to fight for the Jewish people. Yes. I mean, because the Jewish people have not had a fair shot. And believers around the world have not had a fair shot. The people of the book have been alienated, isolated, aggravated, provoked, pushed around, shoved to the corner, disregarded. And if we don't bless and we disregard the Jewish people, the curse has been on the world for a while because we disregard God's promises and his people. Amen? Yeah. Come on, let's bless the people of God today. Stretch your hands for the blessing of Numbers 6, 24 through 26. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai p'nav elecha v'hunecha Yisa Adonai p'nav elecha v'asim lecha Shalom. Amen. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May he shed his face upon you, be gracious to you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace and Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, we pray. Meshem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov.